This talk is all about interfaces, and we're going to start at a fairly basic level to bring everyone up to speed on what they are. Um, I think they're pretty awesome because it, you can just do really interesting things with them that this is really what the talk is going to go through. So it's going to be very example heavy and um, just help you explore different aspects of interfaces and what you might use them for and sort of help you appreciate them. And a few tips and gotchas and looking at the standard library at the end. Okay, so really simple example. We're basically saying we've got an interface with two methods here, non and wink. Um, and if you read an interface like this, the way of looking at it is basically um, these methods are the behaviors. So a gopher is something that um, has the ability to nod and the ability to wink. So if we were just wanting to do some really basic implementation of that, we would create some sort of struct which we can put methods on. And you can see that we've got a method nod and a method wink. And I guess the difference with Go in other languages are you don't have to basically say um, this particular type implements the interface, just having those methods does a job. So it's this cool sort of phrase, implicit satisfaction. Okay, so um, we can test it out. So we've got a function that takes the type gopher, um, it calls nod and wink, and we can basically call a function. And as we would expect, it runs fine. Um, and if a method is missing, so say we've got nod there but we don't have wink, we will end up with a <coughs> compile time error, basically telling us what exactly is wrong. So some gopher doesn't implement gopher because it's missing the wink method. So um, I guess the, the key point here is just to think about method sets. So when you've got an interface, what methods are there? And when you've got types, what methods are there? And basically, if the interface um, is a subset of what type has, you're going to be able to, um, or you can use that, that type implement for the interface. What is play again? Sorry, is that just something? Is that this thing? Is that a yeah. function? Yeah, what is that? Oh, sorry. Um, hold on. Play is basically oh, yes, just calling okay. normal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So it's like super simple, right? So we've got that play function again, and say you've got a bit of business logic, which is you know, playing with gophers, um, and you've got a looping through the gophers, and you're basically calling play. Um, one of the nice uses of doing interfaces within a static type system is basically the logic doesn't need to change every time you add um, an, in, an implementation. So you've got this single gopher, you've got another random Yoda gopher, and we don't really have to change any of the logic, and we can sort of just um, run both of the things. So I guess one thing to just keep in mind is that we can define um, methods and functions that take an interface type, but we can't have um, methods on the interface itself. So something to be aware. OK, so the standard library is full of different interfaces, and we'll touch on more of them a bit later. Um, and one of the things that it really encourages us to do is break down our code into simple bits. So if we're doing something complex, look at combining smaller units together to achieve that complexity. So an example is we have this reader interface. So reader basically has a method read, and there's readers all over the place. So we can look at files, buffers, network connections, HTTP requests, um, and basically um, anything that takes a reader as an input, can, we can sort of, yeah, just use these sources and you don't really have to, these functions are completely independent of where the, the data comes from. 
um, and you can sort of chain them in different ways. If you're taking a reader and outputting a reader, um, you'll make the code quite nice for doing complex things. So another interesting thing, and this is, I guess, a similar example of that, but just maybe on a, on a slightly high level, is that when you're designing applications, there's always, I guess, things you do over and over. So whether it's inside the application, or it's across your different applications and, and sort of different code bases. So one interesting example um, I'd come across at some point was this caching library released by Dropbox in their sort of um, <coughs> Go code, which is in the Dropbox repo. And it effectively has a whole bunch of patterns of caching and managing storage. So one of them, um, cache on storage is quite interesting. So quite often you would say, well, I'm going to do some sort of caching in memory, Redis, memcache, something like that. And then you're going to have some sort of more persistent, like a, you know, whether it's disk or a database or whatever. And you basically want to say, well, if it doesn't exist on that top layer, then go to the next layer and you know, fill the cache. And that's a pattern that effectively they've been able to abstract out, saying that you implement your cache um, as, you know, as long as you implement it as storage, you implement your base layer of storage, and you can actually just combine those two together and um, end up with the storage. So your code base just needs to make sure it needs storage, and suddenly if you want to implement caching, it's really not a big deal. Or if you wanted to switch out a memory cache from to Redis or something like that, it's really easily. So similarly, they've got another thing which basically if you want to rate them at that kind of storage, you could use this sort of tool. Um, the interface is slightly longer, but basically getting items, setting items, deleting items, and it's um, quite cool that they're sharing this kind of thing. So I'm seeing an increasing number of, um, I guess just as people adopt Go, there's quite interesting libraries coming out that um, implement interfaces and make it easy to yeah, extend your code and use them. So, uh, so this is a very light use case of an interface in testing compared to Ryan's examples. But basically, if your functions, so if play is taking an input as um, an interface, we can define fake objects, and we can look at having methods which help us look inside our functions and see what's going on. So in this particular case, we've got a fake go for where we're tracking the state of if it's not a if it's winked, and when you call the methods, we're sort of tracking that state, and we can call run, and we know play is being called, and it's doing its job, and you could assert on those. So. Another uh, reason to use interfaces is when you're making decisions on which packages to use and which piece of infrastructure to use, largely because um, quite often you, know, you make these decisions early in the project and you know, they turn out to be either poor or wrong or you need to optimize something and you need to make a change. So a really simple example is um, in one of our apps at Zamata, we're using this library, Logris, which um, we're using it to, to try out, I guess, a JSON method of logging where instead of putting everything in a, a text string, we're sort of mapping a lot of data in terms of, um, well, basically <coughs> putting the data in a map type structure. But we don't really want our code to be littered with references to Logris and Logris data types. So we've got our own interface that we use for logging, which is this sort of thing info and info f at one and error levels. Um, and if we want to make the decision to use another logging library, we just implement the interface and it's literally sort of a really quick change and we don't have to touch most of the code base. So similarly, um, publishing to a queue using a really simple interface, publish um, mailer and mail. Um, and this sort of stuff tends to be better in the projects doing it earlier rather than later. So there's less things to change. Um, so depending on what you're working on, if you're looking at releasing a package other people use, 
sometimes you find that. Um, so this is an example of a microservices project. It's just about running different bits of code on different systems. The storage component of this application is really not the core of what it's providing. So um, basically, the author of this decided to make storage an interface so you can easily switch between databases or PDC um, to store the data related to um, this particular thing, which manages distributed services. And it just basically puts the um, storage <coughs> onto the user, and if the user wants to use whatever they want, or they just implement the interface storage, which, like the one before, is just getting and setting items. Um, so this is really cool in terms of giving the consumer of that library options and flexibility to extend. Um, but you know, I personally sort of wouldn't really do this in your own app if you don't need those options. Uh, so this is um, about basically saying, so the nature of interfaces are you know, this method set, and there are some problems which work really well, and interfaces just seem like they're a really good you know, um, choice of helping solve the problem. And that's where there's a lot of standardization at the core of the problem. So Docker released a package a few months ago called Docker Machine, which basically lets you spawn and control and manage your Docker hosts across different cloud environments, so Google, AWS. And the way they've basically managed to achieve that is having an interface which lets you control the Docker on it. Um, a Docker host or create a Docker host and you know, start the instance, stop the instance. And basically by making that, um, they've called it you know, the driver, that effectively is the standard. So you know, the challenge that they were trying to solve is basically a common library of controlling Docker hosts and um, you know, effectively just implementing the interface is the key <coughs> work that um, the library does. So just in terms of tips, um, it's really interesting in terms of the standard library. Like I actually didn't have an idea while looking at um, presenting this topic. And I think there was a stat about there are 114 interfaces in Go to 1.3. So these are the, I guess, the more common ones that if you've been using Go for a while, you've probably come across. And um, yeah, I was just really surprised at the number there. So the convention is to name you know, your one method interface by the method. Um, and there is this encouragement to keep the interfaces small, um, but it isn't a hard rule. So you can find plenty of other libraries, plenty of instances of the interfaces in the standard library being a lot longer if that's what they need to do. But I guess the thing is if they're smaller, less work is actually required to satisfy them. So you're more likely to be able to integrate your stuff and make your code a lot simpler. And I guess the key takeaway in terms of the standard library is if you're doing something that's related to the standard library interface, try and integrate with it. So you know, if you're writing the door, take a handler and return a handler instead of maybe inventing um, custom types and things that other people would find difficult to use. Um, in terms of embedding, uh, this is an example from the standard library. So I guess one of the things is that certain functionality in this example would need a reader. Some functions need a writer. Some functions need a read writer. And you're able to sort of compose these things together by embedding and just I guess encouraging the implementations to use less complex types where they can. Um, I guess this is a, an example. So this is something that you do see in the standard library, which is a type conversion or doing a type assert to get access to different functionality, to, to get access to more methods. So say if we had um, functionality saying we've got a method code that we've put on our desktop, and we're saying that um, you know, the interface is a coder, we put our gopher in there and then we can type assert, you know, is the gopher a coder? And this is sort of the comma okay syntax. So if it's okay, then we can call code. Now, it's just important to note that at this point, 
you know, you're not going to have access to not all week um, because it's time for COVID. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so this is really the last point, which is interfaces and the values. Um, so, can anyone guess what these are going to be? So basically we're printing the value of this and then we're saying, is that equal to nil? So, for example, we've got this thing go up, and we're just declaring a variable. Um, you would sort of expect that to be nil, I think. You know, you could say you've got your interface, but, um, you know, you might expect that to be nil. Now, as soon as you assign something to that interface, it gets a little bit more interesting. So, uh, yeah, it's clear this. So, go for two, um, it prints as nil. So when we're actually printing go for two, it says nil, but it's not equal to nil. <laughs> so that's one of the things that is quite interesting because quite often you implement custom error types, and if you're, well, as in, if you choose to use this sort of stuff to implement custom error types, if you return the custom error type where, um, you know, that error is the interface, but inside that is your custom type, and that custom type is nil, basically that thing won't be nil. So you might be doing a nil check, and um, you think you're sort of having, oh yeah, basically it's going to think you've got an error when you actually don't. So, underneath the interface, basically, there's the type and the value captured in there. It's a little bit more complex than that in the sense that it's sort of capturing which methods are available and stuff like that. But when this assignment is made, um, this interface value, go for two, is aware that it's a single plot. So, even if the value is nil, the type has been assigned. And because the type is being assigned, um, the go for won't be nil. So basically, both have to be nil, or um, or just empty for it to be actually evaluated to nil. Um, so yeah, if you are implementing custom errors, return nil instead of your custom types. And that's it. So why, why is the type set when you do the assignment? Okay. This one? So basically, my understanding is that if you were saying, okay, go for two, um, you know, it's of type go for, and the value, how this, I guess, variable is implemented is it knows two things. One is the type, and one is that underlying value. And we've actually told it the type, and as soon as you tell it the type, you basically if you do equals to nil, it, yeah, it's just, it, it knows the type. So for an interface to equal nil, it's, um, yeah, can't have that. So, I mean, I'm not sure if anyone else maybe might be able to come up with that situation. Yeah, it's pretty strange. So an interesting flip side of this case of this, which I've seen, which is quite interesting is basically um, okay so if we had okay we got this right here because yeah um, if yeah, you <laughs> if you did this um, basically this would compile time error if, um, yeah, this would do a compile time error if, yeah, even if we're not, if the single effort didn't implement the GoFor. So this sort of is quite, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know, if that makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's just an interesting thing. It's like, I guess, a property of this sort of 
interface value, whatever it is. So like people are reading updates. It's, it's not really like a, a go pointer, but it's implemented with two pointer values. There's a pointer value that relates to the type, and there's a pointer value that relates to the, the value being stored there. And yeah. But when you declare the um, variable gopher, you should know that the type is gopher. It should have type. Yeah, but I think the thing is the interface, like it's always implemented by something, right? So as soon as we go assign it to singgopher, it's got that information there. And that's what's stopping it being evaluated to you. Singgopher is a struct? No, no singgopher is this thing. Oh yeah, yeah, which is the structure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, just an example. Like at our company, in our credit, it's like I think at one stage we did implement custom error types, and then when we basically did error equal to nil, um, do something that was getting caught, and it was because of this reason. So it's like nice just to watch out for it. Like we introduce more bugs. So, Sorry? It looked like my interview more box. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the thing is, if you're depending on a package that did custom error types and then returned that custom error type, and then you're depending on the package and you're going value error and then error equals to nil, well, <laughs> that's going to be quite bad. So it's almost, you know, never be careful you know, when there are custom error types looking to. You know. So basically, what you would do in that scenario is if it's an actual error, you can return the custom type. If it's not an error, return nil. Don't return nil wrapped in type. Yeah. Cool, that's basically the end. I advise people to sort of go crazy, like make mistakes, learn, learn, learn sort of the limits of the stuff. I think there's um, really interesting use cases for this. So like I found even just one other library that's basically um, related to queuing and you know, they implement queuing as interface and then implement, um, you know, maybe three or four different key types. So, yeah, it's quite cool. And anyone's interested in coding Go Daily, just sort of give us a call. There's six of us doing full time Go and we've got lots of work to do. Yeah. Cool. Thanks.